Roger Hodge is currently deputy editor of The Intercept. Uh, he was formerly editor for Oxford American and Harper's Magazine. His previous book is The Mendacity of Hope, Barack Obama and the Betrayal of American Liberalism. For his latest book, Roger brings things back around to a personal level. level. Uh, several years ago on a trip home uh, to his family's ranch in Juneau, Texas, Roger realizes that his knowledge of his family's past, of the seven generations that have lived on this ranch, is sparse. He sets out to write a history of those generations and in doing so creates a history of the settling of Texas. Uh, the history it thrills like a Western, is researched like a biography, and in many places feels as intimate as a memoir. Of Texas blood, John Jeremiah Sullivan, author of Pulphead, says, Imagine finding out that the land where Cormac McCarthy set one of his brutal novels was your family's ranch. I've read loads of books about Texas, but rarely encountered one so deeply of it, so deep, the story escapes and becomes a treatise on the twisted American past and the force exerted by that on our complex presence. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Roger Hodge to Politics and Press. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. So I have a slideshow that, um, that I'll attempt to uh, match to what I'm talking about. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you, well, that's the cover, um, is a map of Texas. And this, I don't know if you could, you probably can't read this, but uh, the, the part that I'm talking about, the part, the little piece of Texas that I'm most interested in is, well, this whole border, but this little bit right here uh, where the Devil's River and the Pecos River come together uh, with the Rio Grande is, is my little, I think of it as the armpit of Texas. Uh, I think of it as the armpit, the place where a lot happened over the years, over 14,000 years as it turns out. And uh, one thing that happened was that my, uh, in the late 19th century, my family uh, ended up there. And so in the book, I follow my, um, I do a lot of things. It's a kind of complicated, twisty, digressive uh, uh, narrative. But what I start with is, is trying to figure out what is going on in the border country. That since I had left in 1985, uh, w uh, when I graduated from high school, when I would go home, there w I, 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 I was struck by this transformation that had come over the land. The ranches were empty. Livestock was gone. The whole ranching society was, was fading away. The, the economy was turned upside down. Uh, and, and the whole border was being militarized. So from, from the sheep and goat industry being dominant in, in my county, Valverde County, uh, where Del Rio, where I was born, Del Rio, uh, now it's law enforcement. The federal payroll is the dominant payroll, which is something y'all are probably all familiar with. And so that, that, that is a radical shift in, in uh, what, what makes up a community. And, and of course, after 9-11, the walls started going up, the, the fences started going up. And so the, the community, which was really straddling the, the border for, forever, was, was, was cut off from, it, from itself. So, uh, so I, I start, um, if I can remember, in Tennessee, uh, uh, because the ancestor that I, follow, uh, was born there in 1828 in a little town called Newmarket, T Tennessee. His parents, uh, William and Esther Wilson, were, born, were married in that church, or it may be a previous version of that church. And so I follow their paths. They went into Missouri. That was one of their farms. That was William's farm. That was a farm, believe it or not. Uh, and this is something that I notice again and again. Everywhere I go, the landscape has been destroyed. Uh, they're, they're mining it turns out to be a, something, something that uh, pops up again and again in the book. Uh, down the Texas road, through Kansas and, uh, and Oklahoma, through Indian country in, the 1854, in 1854, um, Perry, who had, who had been a 49er, had been back and forth to California, went back to Missouri, and married his sweetheart and brought her to Texas. Uh, brought her down the Texas road, through Oklahoma, 
across the Red River. This is where Colbert's Ferry was, and into the tall grass prairie along the Red River, where he drifted cattle and tried not to get killed by Comanches, because little did the early Texans know, but they were, they were settling a settled place. This was a place that really belonged to someone else. And the Comanche Empire seemed very mysterious to them at the time. They were just these, these, these heathens raiding them, but this, this was their home. Uh, and now that tall grass prairie is largely destroyed as well. And we see other kinds of exploitation happening and different energy economies competing. Here we have pipelines and windmills on the edge of the Llano Estacado. And into South Texas, where uh, they ended up, after multiple trips back and forth to California, uh, down in Frio County in a, a, um, a little community that was overtaken by uh, smallpox and is now gone. But in, this, in the cemetery, you can still find remnants of my family, little Tommy, who died age one. But my, a lot of this talk is going to be about the militar militarization of the border. So this is Falfurius Checkpoint, which, is the, which has the highest seizure rate of any checkpoint in the country. And this, I, this is, the numbers on this sign are pretty low because it was early in the year when I was there. It was February. When I went down to Brownsville for the first time uh, when I was working on the book, uh, I had, uh, I was trying to get inside the, the get inside the militarization to under, so that I could get a sense of what Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection thought they were doing on the border. Uh, because it, it, was, it, it wasn't really clear to me whether it was having any effect uh, uh, other than harassing people. Uh, I, had, I had had a run in with, with the Border Patrol near El Indio when I had gone down to see whether my grandmother had really seen a drone, which I didn't think was really possible, and uh, turned out to be a radar blimp. And, uh, and I got detained because I was looking at it um, <laughs> on a public highway and, I, and then turned around and I, when I got surrounded by eight or 10 Border Patrol vehicles, I said, what seems to be the trouble? And the guy said, you turned around. <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, this is curious. Um, so I got an assignment from uh, Popular Science to write about border security technology, and they were very excited to have popular science cover uh, what they're doing. So I went down to uh, Brownsville, and I got there at kind of a fraught moment. Um, let's see if I can find my page. So I'm going to read a little bit. It only takes five minutes. Uh, I've timed it. so. I won't read for a long time. And then I'm going to tell a little bit of a story of, of, of what I learned there. And I'll, there's a little bit I'll read toward the end. Uh, but uh, this is near Brownsville. This is uh, the beach, very near. I couldn't get all the way down there where the Rio Grande runs into uh, uh, the Gulf. It's called Boca Chica. And that's very nearby. This is, this is where. Uh, U.S. military camp during um, the provocation of the Mexican War. Uh, and that's a, a rescue beacon. A lot of people die down there in the, in, the, in the brush. I arrived in Brownsville, Texas, shortly after the murder of Jaime Zapata, the immigration and customs enforcement agent who was shot dead at a roadblock on a highway between Mexico City and Monterrey in the state of San Luis Potosí by members of the Mexican drug cartel known as Los Zetas. Zapata, a former Border Patrol agent, was a Brownsville native, and his funeral was held two days after I pulled into town. 
A procession passed through the community as residents lined the streets, waving American flags. Some of the Border Patrol agents I spent time with in the Rio Grande Valley attributed the relative quiet along the line that week to the Zapata killing. The, the cartels seemed to be watching and waiting to see what the American response would be. The Gulf Cartel, which had been fighting a war with its former enforcers, the Zetas, for control of the smuggling markets, or plazas, along the South Texas border, resulting in more than 1,000 deaths over the previous year, denounced Zapata's killing and called for justice. Quote, it's clear that the federal government should act without delay against these assassins, the cartel said in a statement, because the spilling of blood in the country is now drowning society. Trying to figure out who's killed more people than between the Gulf Cartel and the Zetas would be difficult. I didn't attend the Zapata funeral, but several weeks later, sitting in an office in the Ronald Reagan office building in Washington, D.C., I watched high-definition video footage that was taken of the Zapata funeral from a U.S. Customs and Border Protection helicopter. The video was shot about three miles out. The mourners at the funeral were probably not even aware that a helicopter was in the area. I watched playback of that video feed on the web portal of a system called the Big Pipe a surveillance asset that I first learned of in Brownsville, which is where I met Kenneth Knight, Deputy Executive Director of National Air Security Operations for the Office of Air and Marine. Ken Knight built the big pipe. So when I got there, Ken, Kenneth Knight saw me. I, didn't, I just saw this very impressive looking guy, this big guy in a tan jumpsuit, looked like a helicopter pilot um, with white hair and square jaw. And somebody said to him that I was the guy from Popular Science. And he said, I need to talk to you. So he takes me and he sits me down and he gives me a briefing about the big pipe because he's very proud of it. And he was there to coordinate air support for the funeral. And so he gave me a, he gave me a, a demo. And it wasn't clear to me exactly what it was. It looked like a website. Uh, but he was tossing out terms like total domain awareness and strongly suggested that the big pipe was how we were going to get total domain awareness on the border. So it was hard, you know, again, I wasn't quite sure what, it, what, what we were talking about, but uh, it seemed after reflecting a bit on our conversation that this that the big pipe might be the framework for what they call a common operating picture, which would integrate and rationalize the, uh, the huge streams of data that were crossing the border. The, the high definition surveillance technology, the, the video uh, feeds, all the, all the photographs uh, that are taken every time you pass through a checkpoint. Like to get in and out of my hometown, you have to go through a checkpoint. And, uh, they, they photograph everything, like your, they, they get your car, they get your license plate, every passenger, the driver, from various angles. And all of this is, all of this is, uh, is hoarded and, and mined uh, for when something goes wrong, or, or maybe they're looking, you know, doing pattern analysis, it's hard to know. Uh, so we have these rivers of data coming through the border. Uh, and somehow you have to be able to rationalize it and, and uh, exploit it. So uh, this seemed to be possibly uh, the, the platform that, that would lead to that. There had already been, this was about the time that SBI Net, which was this $1.5 billion boondoggle, had been, um, had been uh, shut down because it had failed so miserably. So I went on this journey up along the border uh, from Brownsville, to California, ultimately, uh, checking in on the various surveillance assets that I could get my hands on. This is Laredo. They don't have any, um, they don't have any uh, cameras in Laredo because the property owners are powerful and they, they, they kept it out. But you go to other places like Roma and you have this kind of stuff all over the place. Um, this is a, a skybox. Or you have cameras, oops, that's not a camera, that's a hawk. Uh, you have uh, cameras mounted on infrastructure or on towers. And it's called RVSS, uh, Remote Video Surveillance System. 
Oh, you have radar blimps. This is the one in El Indio that got me in trouble. Or you have fences. So this is in my hometown. It's a, a ways away from the border. Uh, so what you have is a no man's land between the river and wherever they can figure out where to build a fence. This one just happens to be along a road. And I suspect if they ever put a, b a wall along the, all the way through Texas, it'll go right down Highway 90. And there'll be millions of square miles that will be in the no man's land, the whole Big Bend, essentially. And as, you, as I go through some of these pictures, uh, try to imagine a wall going through this landscape. I, I, I think a lot of people who've never been along the board, they have no idea what it looks like, no idea what the terrain is like, no idea what, the, what you're, they're talking about when, when they uh, fantasize about a 30-foot concrete barrier. One thing that you see and people laugh about a lot is the, the fence just stops. It'll, the fence, you'll, you'll have segments of fencing, and then all of a sudden it stops in just a tangle of brush. And, and um, people laugh about that. But what they're trying to do, their whole, there's a theory behind it. They're trying to funnel traffic. But people, but, but people don't really, that's a border crossing as well, uh, a dam. And that's the border. And that's the border. Uh, so I, I, I spent time in the control centers of the Border Patrol watching the, the cameras and talking to the uh, the, the specialists who either monitor the seismic sensors or monitor the cameras. And they showed me footage of, of what they call bodies um, making incursions. Uh, and usually the footage was at night and it's, and, and, and it's infrared, so it's white hot. Anything that has, that has heat um, is white. And you see these figures running, but they don't go for the gaps. They go right over the fence. It takes maybe a minute, um, and you s the, but they've maybe tr tri triggered a bug, which is a seismic sensor. So people are waiting for them, and that one minute, the Border Patrol says, will uh, give them a little bit of an advantage in, in trying to make an apprehension. Um, and this, this is Beaver Lake on the Devil's River, uh, which is... Uh, property that, that has been in my family for, for uh, generations, a very historic place along a, um, an old military road. Used to actually be a lake. Um, I'm just throwing in some family stuff. That's my 92-year-old grandmother um, taking some target practice. Um, and one of the things that, that you find in this landscape is a very, very deep history. That painting is probably 4,000 years old. And it's in that canyon that I showed you a little while ago, Seminole Canyon, which runs into the Rio Grande. And then part of the book is, is exploring that deep history and spending time with archaeologists and, and trying to get a sense of how people have lived in this place, uh, and whether successfully or not. And one of the themes that emerges in the book is that the ranching culture that I was, that I was initially kind of elegiacally trying to, to uh, capture in the book, uh, that had passed away after three or four generations, really, was really just like a, a puff of dust in comparison with the long tenure in this place. The, uh, of the Indians. I mean, this, the, the culture that made these paintings, and these are very large, and there are others that are more faded that um, are harder to photograph that are 30 feet high. You could have seen them all the way across the canyon. Uh, they had a stable artistic production in, the, in these canyons for thousands of years. Thousands of years. It's, it's, it's really just uh, stunning to contemplate how long they lived there, how stable their culture was. And um, they were gone long before the Spaniards came. Um, and that's the sacred deer person. Um, 
in their icono in the iconography, which has actually been cracked by the archaeologists. We we understand it pretty well, we think now. Uh, and that's the Devil's River as well. And the Pecos. Uh, so I went on these journeys uh, along along the way. I would go. Uh, the, as I said, the book is highly digressive, and uh, one of the one of the journeys was recreating the the trip out west that Perry and Wellmet took uh, in the late 1850s to go to California. And one of the most stunning documents that I found uh, was the diaries of, well, it's a set of documents really, the diaries of, of women on these, on these wagon trails. Uh, and the reason I was so focused on, on those diaries was because Wellmet, my great-great-grandmother, didn't survive that trip. She died somewhere near Yuma. And so some of these, uh, these photographs are, are also just a, an attempt to help people understand like what people were crossing when they were making these crossings. Uh, that's the Pecos River, also like right on the border where, where the Pecos meets the Rio Grande. And I'm just not sure where you put the wall there. Uh, there are walls already. Um, the, other, the other sense that the, the the other theme that ar arose from the, the research and writing of this book was that the entire border region is an agricultural ruin. Everywhere you go, it's just ruin after ruin after ruin. And so it's a, a mixture of, of ancient ruins, thousands of years old from the native peoples who were there, the railroad ruins, the farming ruins, the ranching ruins. And then this, I'm going to stop here because this was taken just a week or two ago by a border patrolman. This is um, a spot on a, a ranch that my family's uh, run since the 70s. It's not the, the, like the ancestral place. This is the Rio Grande, and it's not distorted at all. That's what it looks like. Th that is an enormous horseshoe bend in the Rio Grande. Um, and we have about three miles of frontage on that bend. And this is where, if you have, has anyone read No Country for Old Men by Cormac McCarthy or, or seen the film? So the opening scene of that book, if you remember, is Llewellyn finds the, the suitcase in the aftermath of this cartel deal that's gone bad. Um, and everything follows inevitably from that moment. Well, the uh, McCarthy sets this novel just west of Lozier Canyon. It's a little, it'd be up there, a little bit further up there. Uh, Lozier Canyon runs into the Rio Grande. This is our family place here. And, um, so he set this, this scene on my family's property. So, so I wrote about this in Harper's Magazine years ago. Um, and the film wasn't made in this part of the country. The film was made further west in New Mexico and, or in, you know, near Marfa, because I think it might uh, just easier, I guess, to film out there. But um, what McCarthy, mu I think what McCarthy probably knew was that there was, um, a long history of smuggling up Lozier Canyon. And uh, in fact, it's been even in our time, uh, even in very recent times, uh, uh, kind of a superhighway for, for smugglers. And I think McCar the way McCarthy writes his books, he was probably in touch with border patrolmen or someone, he, like he was clued in. I don't think it was an accident really that he, that he, put, that he opened the, the book there. Um, so that's where the book, this book really began when I dove into that project, writing about uh, that scene and writing about McCarthy in general and, and the way McCarthy captures the violence, the kind of latent violence that's always 
uh, seems to be under the surface um, in this part of Texas. And um, and I was just struck to get this in the, e in the in an email from my father just a couple of days ago because um, it really shows it dramatizes first of all just h how powerful how, how sort of hard this landscape is and how impossible it is to uh, to police in the way that people uh, you know, from the New York metropolitan area might think you would police things. <laughs> um, and th there's just no way that this, uh, th that a, a river like this, a border like this, which is, you know, this is maybe half a mile at the net, but then you have this huge amount, this huge intrusion that you have to police as well. Uh, so the, uh, there are all these, there's, there, there's always been, this huge amount of uh, trafficking going through this land, and we couldn't get anybody to do anything about it. Like it was clearly known, observed, and watched. the The big pipe was taking note, um, but nothing was happening, and we were afraid somebody was going to get killed. That that it was that a, a hunter or somebody would get killed, and. Our uh, ranch manager started complaining loudly um, and often around town. And then the, um, the local ICE chieftain decided, uh, heard about it and got, a got angry and called him into the office. But he didn't go. So then he had him subpoenaed and had him subpoenaed in Pecos, which is a long way away for the, and, um, so this is the kind of this is the kind of interaction that happens between um, federal law enforcement in West Texas and 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 people um, who just happen to live there, uh, and and you and the people that happen to live there often think that um, that law enforcement really isn't the agenda, um, and not exactly sure what it is. Maybe it's they're just wanting to, to observe this traffic and, and follow it to uh, uh, you know, something more interesting, um, um, bigger fish, but it's, it's, no, it's no fun for the people who live here. Um, so this is the Big Bend where uh, my great-great-uncle uh, had a ranch. This is a, an actually an exhibit on um, um, Big Bend National Park the Homer Wilson Ranch. Um, and again, I just invite you to consider how do you put a wall through this landscape. So again, you, you, you encounter in the, as a kind of punctuation as you travel west um, the assets of the border security complex. And the, the different kinds of fences, you have your picket fences, you have your mesh fences, you have your Jersey vehicle barriers, which is what, you, what mostly um, is deployed in New Mexico and Arizona. See the discontinuity. You have the, the fence runs through neighborhoods. This is a, a park in El Paso. You see the fence, you barely see the border fence back here, behind homes, through playgrounds. There's what is no fence there. That's the Rio Grande, that great big river. And so when I was in El Paso, I, I went on patrol with this guy for a while, and then he took me into a... Um, control center and it was it was a very small control center as compared to the one in in Brownsville and th there was this kind of angry looking man sitting there with a small number of screens and all these blinking lights and all the blinking lights were the seismic sensors that were all going off and he was trying to clear them one one by one trying to clear them so he was he was having these profanity laced interactions with field agents who were out trying to clear the seismic sensors, which were always going off 
and there are always false alarms. And he told me a story about how he ended up in that room. Uh, because by the way, the worst possible job you can have in the Border Patrol is sitting in front of a screen or watching those sensors. It's, it's absolutely the worst. And so what happened to him was he got shot in the chest with a machine gun and was put on disability and then was given a job s sitting in the control room. Uh, the, the, hand, the, the public affairs guy who took me in there was extremely upset by the interaction that we had. Um, it was not, it was not the, the pretty picture of border technology that he, he was hoping that I would walk away with. So I, so I guess what I'm trying to get across is this strange uh, juxtaposition between incompetence and violence and neglect on the ground and the ruthless kind of efficiency of the, of, of the technological agenda along the border. Um, and I think, I think that the, the outcome of, that, of, of what is happening down there has very little to do with the border itself. So I'm going to read a little bit more um, from Kent, my, I came, when I came back to visit Ken, Kenneth Knight, I also spoke with uh, a guy named Mark Burkowski, who buys all the, the toys for, custom, uh, for Customs and Border Protection. And uh, he gave me a long rigmarole about how, how you know, the technology is not the answer. There's not one. There's not one fix for any one problem. What we really need is comprehensive border, uh, comprehensive uh, immigration reform, which was nice to hear. And I actually hear it a lot from high-ranking customs and border protection people. They think there's a political solution, not a technological solution. But at the same time, they like the technology. So Knight was talking about total domain awareness. But he wasn't just talking about a specific operational zone like the Rio Grande Valley sector. He was aiming at a much larger domain, fusing the national air radar picture with the coastal marine surface radar picture and adding in all the CBP feeds along the border and the video surveillance cameras in the ports along with the airborne surveillance, the airborne video sources, the drones, the P3 aircraft, the helicopters, as well as surveillance assets in metropolitan areas so that the scope of operations expanded to the widest possible extent. This broad spectrum of surveillance is really what Knight seemed to have in mind when he spoke about total domain awareness, an operating picture that encompassed pretty much the entire United States. At that point, the potential for real-time, persistent, and pervasive surveillance of a target comes into view. Total domain awareness means the ability to apply these tools anywhere in the United States. When I thought about the full scope of the big pipe and the ambitions of its creators, it was clear to me that the border had become a laboratory, a controlled environment in which new security techniques could be perfected and where military tactics could be adapted for, sub for domestic application. The mission of securing our national borders has become indistinguishable from a new and still emerging understanding of what constitutes homeland security. It was hard to avoid the conclusion that the border itself was slowly expanding to fill the entire continent. Before long, we may all find ourselves inside the big pipe. This, by the way, is the 1598 crossing of Don Juan de Oñate, who, who came up the Camino Real from, um, from Mexico City and, and, and founded New Mexico. This is the first monument, monument number one of, of the land border, wh where the Rio, the Rio Grande comes out of its Rift Valley in New Mexico and hits the border right at the, this little corner um, where El Paso, right west of El Paso, 
uh, where the New Mexico border begins. And this is the, the plaza um, where uh, part of the Mexican Revolution was plotted in that adobe house. And there's Rudy Garcia with his little pistol, which he calls Betsy, uh, who was one of my, my uh, Virgils. And he's the one of the custodians of Mount Cristo Rey, which is this um, incredible shrine right there um, at that border. Just a few images from Mount Cristo Rey. The most terrifying hanging road I've ever been on. It's just as wide as a Jeep. And they have a pilgrimage the last weekend in October, which I think that's where we are. Um, it was this past weekend uh, where tens of thousands of people walk up this mountain and uh, the Matachines uh, dance at the summit. A lot of people do it barefooted. More fence. But what I'm trying to, that's the old border fence before the Secure Fence Act of 2006. Apache Pass in Arizona, more border country with mountains. And I'm just going to go ahead here. I'm trying to get to um, the intercept where I work. So a lot of the work that we do at the intercept has a direct application to this question of the big pipe and, 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 um, and this total domain awareness. There's a company called Palantir. We've, we've done a, quite a bit of reporting about. And uh, my colleagues, Spencer Woodman and uh, Ryan Devereaux and Alice Sperry and Sam Biddle in particular have worked on Palantir. Palantir is one of these companies that was f originally funded by, um, I'm going to wrap it up quickly, don't worry. Uh, by InQtel, the CIA's venture capital uh, firm. And they, uh, we know from Snowden um, documents that, that Palantir was involved with creating some of the uh, most powerful tools in the NSA's arsenal, such as X key score. And Palantir is involved with creating data mining software for ICE and for Homeland Security Investigations, which is a division of ICE which conducts a broad spectrum of investigations that are totally unrelated to immigration. And what they do is they, they the, the software allows the uh, exploitation of all these different databases from all across the government, which is this, this slide is attempting to chart. Um, and this one as well. I can't really get into the details. Um, but it's a nice, friendly, square job HSI agent here. Um, and what they're doing is the, 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 the government, all these different agencies, DOJ, DEA, ATF, FBI, all the federal and local agencies, they're all attempting to integrate. And fortunately, they fight amongst themselves, and they hate each other. But uh, slowly but surely, firms like Palantir are attempting to um, create software that will pull these, these data sources together. And anybody who's worked with a lot of data, like my colleague Margot, will tell you that, that quality control in big data sets is really tough. And so when you have these giant databases coming from all these different parts of the government, um, there can be lots of the, a lot of false information. And so you take, you take the, the integration of all of these data sources and you put it in the hands of an agency like ICE, which has become very politicized, as recent emails discovered through FOIA show. Um, 
ICE field agents were directed to find egregious cases for political exploitation by the administration during the first round of, of um, immigrant raids in February. Coming directly from the Secretary of Homeland Security, John Kelly. So you take all of this and you put it together and my friends, we are in the big pipe. Thank you. Yes, there's a microphone over here. Hello, hello, yeah. I have a couple of very short questions, if I may. Yes. Um, the first one is, Texas from 1836, I believe, to 1846 was an independent republic. And since then, it's been a state of the United States. Is there any nostalgia for being a republic? And if so, how does it manifest itself? I, I think there is uh, a lot of nostalgia in Texas, not only for being a republic, um, but also nostalgia for the Mexican War and the Indian Wars and um, the Civil War. Uh, it manifests itself in ways that we can all see every day in the news, uh -huh. I think. Uh, but in 1846, the Texans voluntarily became a state. They, they could have stayed a republic. Oh, they always meant to be a state. Yeah. Oh, there, there, there's no doubt about it. Okay. They always meant to be a state. Andrew Jackson and, and Sam Houston, uh, um, to use uh, the, the word of the day, colluded um, <laughs> to uh, to wrench this northern state of Mexico away from uh, Mexico, and it, it, annexation was always always the plan. I see. Yeah. And the second question is: uh, up here in Washington, a lot of us see Texas as a rather politically conservative state, and. Um, are there any simple reasons for that that you could describe? Uh, well, one is gerrymandering. I think it's actually a very complex and, and diverse state politically. You have these large liberal cosmopolitan cities surrounded by um, sparsely populated uh, red counties. And uh, Texas in the past was a, was a big New Deal state. You, you had a, a long populist history. Um, and 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 now, you know, th this it's a it's a complicated story. But basically, it's it's manipulation and corruption that has allowed the um, the right wing Republicans to maintain control of the state. Because if you look at it in pure demographic terms, it's very quickly turning blue. But um, you know, w w it's a messed up system. So. Um, but but if you look at the at the at the most populous counties, they are extremely uh, diverse and cosmopolitan and mm. multicultural. Thank so you. So I think yeah. Thanks for the questions. Is anybody studying, or maybe it's too late, the relationships across the border of like families and friends? I think people are, and and uh, there are all kinds of. Sociologists and borderlands historians and journalists and um, and writers who are better equipped to write about Mexico than I am who who do write about this and and record this. Uh, it's 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 a real challenge for people uh, who have family on both sides of the border nowadays. Uh, and you are they allowed at all? To yeah, people can cross, but it's just it's made very difficult. It's made very difficult, and it and the the border cities are on the Mexican side are very dangerous. And if and there's a rash of I mean, the, there's actually been more killings recently than in, in the in the really bad days of the cartel war. Uh, but they haven't been getting a whole lot of press. So it's it's not that people can't see their families. They can go, you can get a you can go across. It's just it's. It's made um, more difficult. Thank you. thank you. Well, thank you. This was fascinating. Um, 
I'd like to ask you to say a little more about this death of agriculture and ranching on the border and um, about the um, corresponding, I guess, uh, incursion of the federal government as the principal employer. And then related to that, is it true all across the border or are there variations you've noticed from Del Rio to Eagle Pass, Laredo, and so forth? I think there's still, well, there's still a lot of agriculture in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, traditional crop farming. Um, the ranching economy collapsed so it began, I think it began to, when I, when I graduated from high school in 1985, it was still thriving. By the time I got to New York City in 1992, things were already getting uh, dicey. Uh, the, part of it had to do with the repeal of the Wool Act, which destabilized the market for wool and mohair. And the, I think NAFTA was a huge part of it. And all, all of the uh, wool and mohair production just went overseas. It, the, it really has to do with, with national macroeconomic policies and trade policies. And um, it's a little bit above my you know, pay grade to understand exactly what happened. But very quickly, in the course of a decade, the ranches, the, la the large production ranches in um, all the counties that I'm aware of, and not just in the border, but all over the state. But there was a, there was a, there was a zone, there was a particular zo heavy zone of sheep and goat ranching in the Edwards Plateau area. They all emptied out. There's still, some, there's still a few remnants. Um, and then the, the, Militarization really got started under Clinton, um, but it just picked up after 9/11, and the Secure Fence Act was a big part of it, of 2006. And then the, they, you know, since 9/11, they doubled the size of the Border Patrol. Um, so we went from, you know, two dozen people that were that were originally hired to keep Chinese out. Um, the, the Border Patrol were created as part, ultimate, really were part of the Chinese Exclusion Acts um, to this giant paramilitary force of, I don't know what it is now, 25,000. I've heard a couple of interviews with Senator Cornyn in which he emphasizes the difference between Texas and the other border states with the idea that an awful lot of the land in Texas is privately owned as opposed to Arizona, New Mexico, and California. Do you have any comments on that? And uh, what do you think might happen? That's true. I mean, that has to do with Texas's pe peculiar aggressive history and in, in making sure that there were no Indians left. Right. Uh, and and the federal government gave, gave all the um, land that should have been federal land to the state after annexation. I don't know that it makes much difference whether, uh, when it comes to these issues, whether it's private land or um, public land, the advantage of the public land is that the public can get to it. And so, so in, in Arizona, there are these magnificent parks, like Apache, right. Apache Pass is in the, mid, in the midst of this amazing park. So you can actually get to some of these historic places and, and, and have a feel for it. But in terms of border enforcement, I don't think it makes any difference at all. Won't the, won't the private landowners demand compensation, though, if a wall is built on their property? Well, they'll fight, but we've already seen th through the first round. I mean, there's still there's still a lot of lawsuits in right. play in in the valley. And the private landowners will fight. It, they will fight condemnation if it actually gets to that point. 
but ultimately they'll lose, just like the, the people in the Big Bend lost when the park was coming in, if it comes to that. All right, any final questions? All right, how about one more round of applause for Roger?